Hello, my name is Pavel Afanasyev, and first I would like to apologize I couldn't make it to Brazil. Um, nevertheless, I recorded the lecture for you, and I hope you'll find it useful. The title of the lecture is The Use of Fourier Transforms in Cryo-EM. Um, it's very difficult to cover the full topic of Fourier Transforms uh, within one hour. Therefore, um, the idea of this lecture is to illustrate to you why Fourier transforms are so important in cryo-EM and to give you a background uh, for an intuitive use and for intuitive understanding of uh, the math behind. So my talk will consist of several sections. I will start with one-dimensional uh, periodic functions um, I'll cover the idea of the Fourier transforms of those. Then I'll switch to uh, two-dimensional periodic functions or images. We will talk about Fourier transforms of the images. And uh, we'll also um, talk a little bit about the Fourier transforms of uh, the um, 3D functions or uh, volumes, cryo-EM maps. And finally, um, I'll try to discuss the applications of Fourier transforms. Uh, in uh, electron microscopy. The first time um, Fourier transforms uh, were used in electron microscopy uh, was in the middle of the 20th century. And uh, that happened uh, thanks to the uh, crystallographers who were um, starting uh, doing electron microscopy. And Derzier and Kluck were two scientists who studied bacteria, the, the, the tail of the uh, bacteriophage T4. And they used methods from X-ray crystallography uh, for determination of uh, 3D reconstruction uh, from an object. Uh, and they used these methods um, of the Fourier analysis in order to obtain the structure of the bacteriophage T4 uh, tail. So in this lecture, I will try to explain what exactly they were doing and what are the methods behind. Um, today, it's very difficult to imagine uh, the field of cryo-electron microscopy without Fourier transforms. And pretty much uh, starting with the uh, data collection, uh, we are using uh, Fourier transforms everywhere. Uh, from the CTF correction, uh, it's uh, pre-processing stages of the data analysis up to the validation of your final 3D reconstructions using Fourier shell correlation. Um, let's start uh, with the very basics. And first, I would like to um, introduce um, or define periodic functions. So what is periodic? Periodic means um, uh, the, the function where you can add any period to the, to the function and then you'll get the same function back. The easiest way to imagine that would be uh, if you look at the uh, simple sinusoid. So this is the function sine x. And um, uh, the, the function sine x can be generalized in, uh, in these terms, where a uh, would be an amplitude. And we know that a equals 1 in this case, so the amplitude of a function would be the distance uh, between um, the um, uh, x-axis and um, uh, the highest uh, crest of the function. In a way, this is how high the wave of the function is. Now, the second uh, important parameter would be the period. And uh, the period would be the distance between um, two crests of the function. So in case of our function, the period would be uh, uh, our sinusoid function, the period would be equal to 2 pi. Also, a uh, period uh, you'll find sometimes is um, known as a wavelength of the function. Now, the third parameter which we'll be talking about is the phase. Um, and uh, to talk about the phase, uh, if we want to talk about the phase of the function, it's easier if you imagine another function, for example, sine x minus pi over 4. And uh, pi over 4 would be the phase 
and uh, that would be the distance between these two functions. So uh, this is how, um, if you imagine that this axis would be time, it means that how slow or what is the delay of this um, of these two functions. And uh, it's also sometimes denoted as a phase shift. So knowing these two functions and looking at this general equation, we can easily assign uh, values for the phase, for the period, um, or the wavelengths, and for the amplitude. Now, in cryo-EM, and for us, it would be important also to talk about the frequencies. Um, and frequency is uh, related to the period uh, or the wavelengths as 1 over t. So um, the, the period, uh, sorry, the, the frequency uh, would illustrate how fast the uh, function will be changing. And uh, um, it's defined as a number of cycles per second or x axis unit. Um, in cryogenic, as I mentioned, um, we would be focused in definitions of any functions uh, using these three variables, amplitude, phase, and the frequency. So the simplest operation we could think about uh, when we work with uh, periodic functions would be summing. So what means to sum or to average two functions? Again, uh, let's consider one function. The first one which we talked about already would be sine x. And the second one will have um, a different uh, um, amplitude and a different frequency. It will be one third of sine 3x. So if we sign these two functions, you'll see that the second function has the minimum where the first one has the maximum. And if we average or if we sum these two functions, we'll get something like this. So this will be the sum of these two functions. Uh, let's consider the reverse operation, which is called the composition. So the idea of the Fourier transforms actually is in, in the following. Any periodic function can be represented as a sum of sinusoids or, or uh, the sum of other periodic functions. For example, let's consider a, a more complicated function which would look like this. And it turns out that this function can be represented as a sum of the following functions which you can see here on the right. So first one, it would be the sine x, which you can see here. And then if we add to sine x a second function, which would look like this, the sum of these two would be here. The blue curve will be the sum of these two functions. Now, if we consider the third function, which will have higher frequency, and if we average these three functions, they will already um, approximate the original function quite well. But moreover, if we take the fourth function, uh, we can fully represent or we can fully reconstruct the original functions which we started with. So the four, the sum of these four functions would be the original function we wanted to decompose it into. And this is called decomposition. Representation of the function as a sum of uh, other functions. Um, and you might ask, how do we get all these um, values of the amplitudes and the phases? How do we know uh, how to represent or how to decompose the function into it? And that's exactly what the Fourier transform would be doing. So the Fourier transform allows you to decompose any periodic function into the series of sine waves. And the person who came up with such an idea and who described it was the French mathematician Fourier. He came up with this formula. This formula might look a bit complicated for you, but actually it's very simple. So these two terms, they are very much related because sine and cosine function are different just by addition of, uh, uh, of pi over two. So we can just focus on one of them, right? And then we also have a constant here, which you can ignore for now. So basically, this function would be the sum of these sinusoids. And in order to get this amplitude, uh, which um, Bm would actually be, uh, we would have to calculate um, these integrals. 
so a bit complicated, but uh, there are ways how to cal calculate those. And A and B would be the amplitudes here. So there is an equation which allows to uh, perform such operations of the composition of functions as a sum of some other functions. Now, the most important part about that is that the Fourier transform can be fully inverted. What does that mean? If we have our function, and we call it the function which is in the real space, and if we perform the Fourier transform, if we decompose it as a sum of some other functions, we'll be working now in so-called reciprocal or Fourier space. So we perform one Fourier transform and we get um, another function, which is a sum of some functions. And then if we perform an inverse Fourier transform, we would be able to get our function back in real space. Now, um, as I already mentioned, such kind of decomposition would imply that the terms which we would be using or the functions which would be using they would have certain properties and you can already see here uh, some trends so um, as we described before um, we can um, calculate the amplitude period and phase for each of these functions and we will see that the, for example, the wavelength of the first function would be 2 pi and the frequency would, would be 1 over 2 pi. And then we can um, again determine the wavelengths for the second one and the frequency for the second one. And what we can see here is that the frequency for each uh, further function, for each um, next term in this decomposition will be actually higher and higher we can see that the wavelength is getting smaller and the frequency is getting higher. So the highest frequency um, which we'll be using for our decomposition will be called the Nyquist frequency. Um, and uh, deciding on how, um, what will be the size of, uh, of these uh, frequencies or what we, would be the size um, of, um, uh, of the very highest frequency for the decomposition is related to the term which is called sampling. So it's in case of 1D case and one dimensional case, it would be just de defined by the smallest wavelengths which we would be using for the decomposition. And in case of um, two dimensional, in, uh, for two dimensional case for the images or for the um, in three dimensional case, that would be determined by the pixel size or by the voxel size. And in turn, um, these are defined just by your magnification of the microscope. Why is it important? Um, uh, it's important because um, of the final resolution we would be aiming for. And, uh, in, and it's important uh, to uh, be able to decompose any function um, as fine as possible. Why? Because if we use uh, frequencies which would be too large, would not be able to reconstruct the original signal. And that's what the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem is about. It says, signal sampled at rate f can be fully reconstructed if it contains only frequency components below half sampling frequency. Um, so that means that in order to fully reconstruct your signal, um, you need to have certain type of sampling or you need to have certain type of your pixel size. And uh, um, in case of uh, cryo-electron microscopy, uh, where the Nyquist frequency term will be used, is uh, in terms of the maximum theoretical resolution which you would be able to achieve. And that would be equal to 1 over 2 times your pixel size. So now when we defined um, the Fourier transforms, when we defined um, the sampling, um, it's very important again to um, denote two domains which we are working with, the uh, so-called real space uh, domain um, or spatial domain and Fourier space domain, or we will know that it's called a frequency domain. So um, we were able to decompose 
this function uh, as a sum of uh, these four. And for each of these four, uh, we know its frequencies and we know the amplitudes. And we can create a plot um, of uh, the frequencies which would be the, the, uh, of the frequencies and amplitudes. Um, and uh, Fourier transforms um, have a properties of being symmetric, and that's why we have um, four um, amplitudes corresponding to its frequencies uh, as positive and four as negative. So in principle, we can, uh, if we know this side of the plot, we would also know this side of the plot. And this is called amplitude spectrum. So any function would be, um, it's possible, would be possible to, uh, to think about it in terms of their amplitudes, phases, and in terms of their frequencies. Now, as I said before, um, it's very important to have higher frequency terms in the decomposition. And uh, these higher frequency terms um, would be defining uh, how good we decompose the, the function. And for example, if you have some kind of an exotic function, which would look like this, um, we would be uh, taking more uh, sinusoid functions with higher and higher frequencies. And they will be describing this function better and better until it um, converges. And I have an example here, and I hope I can start it, this video. So you can see here um, that with adding more, more and more terms, uh, the function is being approximated better and better. And as I uh, noticed, uh, as I said before, the frequency of the very last term, the highest term will be called Nyquist frequency. And it reflects the sampling um, which we have chosen. Um, you can uh, already see here that for uh, some sharp features, uh, we would uh, need to have uh, a lot of uh, different functions. And the truth is that actually for the very sharp uh, like edges, we would need an infinite number of functions in order to decompose the original function uh, completely. So finder sampling implies using more functions with higher frequencies. Yes. Um, and um, if you are familiar with complex numbers, um, it's very important to note that um, the Fourier transforms can be expressed in a slightly different form. Um, and um, um, in terms of the complex numbers, we know that uh, the complex numbers would have their amplitudes and phases, just the numbers can be expressed slightly different. And it's just another representation of Fourier transform. And sometimes you'll be seeing that the Fourier transforms will, will be expressed in terms of their amplitudes. Uh, in, 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 uh, the sometimes Fourier transforms would be expressed uh, in this form, uh, in the form of uh, complex numbers with their amplitudes and their phases. So I already um, mentioned to you that there are issues with the sharp features of the fu functions and that they would need an infinite number of functions. And how, and you, you might be asking, how do we deal with that in real life? Because instead of uh, a sum, uh, of these functions we will have to integrate uh, over uh, the infinite number of terms. And uh, you can easily, or you can, not easily, but you can imagine that um, actually the images which you will be working with, um, they are uh, consisting of pixels and therefore uh, this decomposition of image into a pixel um, would be uh, somewhat uh, its own periodic function. And when we will be talking about Fourier transforms of the images, we would be talking about so-called discrete Fourier transform, which is implemented using fast Fourier transform algorithm. And sometimes in some image processing uh, programs, you will uh, see this term FFT. And that means it's just an algorithm for implementation of the Fourier transform. And it's very fast using this algorithm, you are able to uh, calculate the Fourier transforms very efficiently. Um, and these Fourier transforms would be uh, expressed um, or these uh, 
coefficients, uh, the, the, the Fourier components would be expressed uh, uh, as a sum rather than as an integration uh, over the infinite number of uh, terms. So it might have been a bit complicated for you and you might ask why would we bother? Why would we need to represent it in terms of why, why would we need to decompose any kind of function? And the answer for that is because it is very convenient. And later on you'll see uh, there is a spoiler that you will um, be able to compute it much faster uh, using Fourier transform compute um, certain um, things much faster than if you would have to compute them in real space. So let's now generalize our approach uh, for, uh, for the 2D case and let's talk about the images. This is an image of um, uh, 20S proteasom dataset, it's a micrograph. Um, this was collected on the Falcon 3 camera which has 4096 pixels in this dimension and 4096 pixels in this dimension. Um, nowadays you might be using already the next generation of the detector, for example Falcon 4 detector, uh, but all these detectors, Falcon 3, 2 and 1 and 4, have the same dimensions, 4K by 4K with a size of 16.7 megapixels. Some of you might be using different cameras, uh, for example Gatan K2 or Gatan K3, um, and they have slightly different dimensions. Uh, but uh, it's comparable um, in terms of the magnitude uh, there, um, the, the size of these detectors. Uh, moreover, if you talk about uh, just digital cameras, uh, the camera in the latest uh, iPhone um, will, will be uh, even bigger than these uh, cameras which are used in CryEM, and it would be composed of uh, close to 50 megapixels. Um, now let's talk just about um, about photos uh, for simplicity. And um, let's consider such a photo of Marin Van Hill and uh, he's holding here um, a camera and if we start zooming in um, in this uh, in, in this photograph we will see um, uh, the camera zoomed in and then we will see this lens uh, and if we zoom in further we will start seeing actually an image uh, with some pixels. It's a pixelated image and uh, in this case it will be 20 by 20. So if we zoom in at any other area of this, photographs, of this photograph uh, we will see this pixelated uh, zoomed in image. What does it mean? So again here I have 20 pixels in this dimensions and 20 pixels in this dimension. This is the cropped area which we're talking about like in case of the uh, cameras we were talking about. So each pixel will have its own intensity. It might be whitish or it might be more grayish or it might be very dark. So that means each pixel will have its own intensity and depending on how white or how um, black it would be, we can actually assign uh, different values to these intensities. And if we consider uh, such a palette, uh, we can say that uh, very dark uh, areas uh, would be having intensity of zero and very white would be having intensity of 255. Why 255? Or 255 plus zero will be 256. This is two in the power of eight. And that describes um, uh, eight bit imaging. So that means that we'll have 256 shades of gray in our image. If we consider 16 bit, uh, we'll have much larger number of shades of gray. So now, um, if we um, represent each uh, pixel of the image in terms of its intensities, we can assign a number to each pixel, which would uh, be the number of the Oh, which would be the intensity value for each pixel. So, um, and then as you can see here, uh, very um, bright areas would have higher values. For example, this white one, uh, whitish, would be 183, and then very dark would be having something like 18 or 19 and so on. 
and uh, <clears throat> we're talking about dimensionality all the time and then before uh, we talked about uh, 1D curves, one dimensional curves and uh, we were talking about sinusoids and so on but what 1D curve actually means is that we have only a single coordinate and uh, um, we uh, this coordinate um, we can uh, have a pair of, of the value which would be another value uh, in this plot and this is the coordinate value so we were always plotting our curves um, in, in this grid. But what uh, we actually um, can do, we can assign uh, the intensity value uh, for, uh, for this curve. And uh, uh, for example, everything which will have higher intensity, depending on the x coordinate, will be uh, having, um, uh, will be uh, depicted as white here so and this is 1d curve so in case of the images we will talk again uh, in two dimensions but now uh, in terms of the x and y coordinates so each pixel will have its intensity but also each pixel will have coordinates x and y and in case of 1d we have only one coordinate in case of 3d we'll have three coordinates plus the intensities so this is about the dimensionality. So now, um, as we noted before, um, since the image can be represented in terms of its intensities, and we're going now in the world of 2D, um, we can represent an image as a linear combination of some other images. And uh, in this case, um, if you want to decompose an image uh, which would be 3x3, three three, a very simple image with its own intensities, we can decompose it in real space. Uh, we can just decompose it as a sum of such so-called base vectors um, with uh, certain uh, coefficients, which would be um, similar to the amplitudes. So any image in real space can be decomposed in terms of, again, the sum of some other images uh, and um, this is a good analogy to think about uh, uh, Fourier transforms. Um, and um, let's talk about the actual Fourier transforms and what um, the Fourier transforms, how they would look like um, if we perform a Fourier transform of very simple functions. For example, let's perform a Fourier transform of this sinusoid but in 2D. So we have oscillations only in one direction here. So the Fourier transform of such an image would look like two dots um, in this direction. So why two dots is because two, because uh, as I mentioned before, Fourier transforms have um, the symmetry. Um, and um, um, it has, it will be exactly the same in the negative direction as in the positive direction. Now, if we imagine another Fourier transform of this of such an image, which is similar but rotated by 90 degrees, we will see two dots, which would be again rotated by 90 degrees. What's more interesting if to consider another sinusoid, which would be oscillating but at higher frequencies. So the Fourier transform in Fourier space, this image would look like this. And now compare, comparing these two, we can see that the frequency here is higher. And that means that the distance between these two dots would be larger. Everything which is closer to zero here to the center of the image would be representing lower frequency information. Everything which would be going towards the edge will be representing the higher frequency information. And again, you can imagine easily that if we have something like this, uh, again, um, this operation is equivalent to the rotation. In, in the perpendicular direction uh, to uh, the distribution of the wave uh, of these waves, we don't have any oscillations. Yes, that's why uh, in this direction we have zero. Um, and if we have a superposition of these and a perpendicular uh, function, which would look like these checkers, Obviously, we will have something like uh, four dots here. So, um, using such decomposition 
um, we can talk about representing our real space image from before um, and that represents probably number one in the lens it's in real space we can uh, decompose uh, the image into D in real space as a sum of uh, these um, um, of these images uh, from the Fourier space. So the same way how we were talking about 1D Fourier transform, we can create a 2D Fourier transform and to uh, decompose any image as a linear combination of um, uh, of the uh, Fourier uh, components. And uh, um, the good thing about it is that uh, the same way as we are talking about uh, the 1D Fourier transform, you can uh, create Fourier transforms as many times as you want. You can transform there and back. You can create uh, the forward and an inverse Fourier transform and work with it. It's very convenient. Um, the same way as we were talking about the amplitude spectrum in 1D case, we can talk about uh, the uh, amplitude spectrum in 2D case. So if we take a test image, if we create a Fourier transform, we will get this amplitude uh, spectrum. Um, and when we're talking, when we're in the world of cryo-EM, we will be talking about so-called power spectrum. So power spectrum and amplitude spectrum basically is the same thing, um, with the difference that amplitude uh, squared would be the power. Um, and it's just easier to talk in terms of the power spectrum because it would be reflecting the, um, the actual intensities we, which we see in the images. And together with the amplitude spectrum, you should also realize that we always have, when we perform a Fourier transform, we we'll, we'll always have phases. And, um, and this would be represented by so-called phase spectrum. So when we create the Fourier transform, we'll, we have amplitudes and phases at the same time. Now, um, as I said, as I briefly mentioned before, everything which is closer to the center of this image would correspond to the lower frequency information. And everything which would be going further from the center up to here um, will be corresponding to a higher frequency information with the highest frequency being a Nyquist frequency. And um, let's consider a very simple operation. Uh, which we can do in both spaces, real space and Fourier space. Let's talk about sem uh, scaling. So if we have an image, which would be six by six pixels, and as I mentioned above, um, each pixel will have its own intensity. What we can do, we can scale our image. For example, we want to bin our image by the factor of two. What would it mean? It means that if we have an image of six by six pixels, if we bin it by the factor of 2, we will get an image of 3 by 3. If we had sampling or pixel size of 1 angstrom per pixel here, then uh, the sampling here would be uh, 2 angstrom per pixel after binning. And each um, pixel on the binned image will be an average of 4 pixels from this image. So an average of 0, 0, 1, and 3 will be 1. Now we can move further, and then we can take an average of these 4, which will be 4, and an average of these 4, which will be 2. And this way we can calculate um, uh, the, the, the values for all the other pixels in this image, uh, which will not necessarily be integers. And uh, then this way we would be performing the binning in real space. Um, and as I said, it's important to know that the sampling or the pixel size of the uh, binned image will be twice um, larger than the pixel size of the original one. How would we do the scaling in Fourier space? In Fourier space, we can take an image and we can create a Fourier transform. And if you create a Fourier transform of an image um, of, a, of a micrograph from cryo-EM, you will see this pattern which is called uh, uh, tone rings. And um, uh, in later lectures, you will hear about the tone rings. So what we can do uh, in order to bin uh, this image of 4K by 4K, we can take the central part of the image uh, and uh, the central part will be twice smaller than um, these dimensions. It will be 2048 pixels by 2048. And um, 
uh, if here, as I said, will be the Nyquist, the original Nyquist frequency, here would be uh, the Nyquist frequency over 2. And then what we can do, we can just crop it. We can crop the original image and create an inverse Fourier transform. And if we create an inverse Fourier transform, our original image will be bent to 2K by 2K, and the pixel size will be twice coarser than the original pixel size. Using this operation, we uh, can define the cropping area, um, which would be pretty much any. And that means that we can bin also non-integer. And this type of binning allows you not to introduce any kind of interpolations, uh, which is much better than doing uh, binning in uh, real space. So, and this operation is called Fourier cropping. So we use Fourier transforms for beaming, for example. Now, another operation which you can be doing using uh, Fourier transforms would be Fourier filtering. Again, we take an, uh, a test image, and this image is very nice actually because it contains lots of high frequency information here in the cloth of the lady, and also uh, these checkers in the tablecloth. So, any image, as I said, we can perform um, uh, the Fourier transform of this image, and then we will get uh, an amplitude spectrum. So, again, what we can do with this amplitude spectrum, we can consider a distribution of different, uh, of different uh, amplitudes. Um, and um, what if we focus now only on the middle part of this amplitude spectrum? What if we set everything else to zero? So we'll have only the central part of this amplitude spectrum. And then uh, if we create an inverse Fourier transform, we'll get an image like this. So all the high frequency information, all the tiny details in the image will, will be gone. And this is called low pass filter. We are allowing to pass only low frequency information. That's why it's called low pass. Now, if we consider um, another case where we cut off everything, like 20% um, uh, from the original uh, data in terms of the, the, the frequency domain, uh, if, we, if we cut off everything up to Nyquist over 5 um, in, in, in the low frequency information and we create an inverse Fourier transform, we will get an image like this. And we see that all the high frequency information is preserved However, all the shades, all the features, the like large features, which correspond to um, uh, all the features uh, in the image uh, or the gradient of illumination and stuff like that will be gone. And uh, using such an operation, it allows us to focus on the high frequency details. We are passing on the high frequencies and that's why this operation is called high pass filter. Um, we can also consider a combination of both um, and we can use a ring over the Fourier transform over the uh, amplitude spectrum and then that will be called, called bandpass filter. So we are uh, allowing to pass a certain, um, a certain fraction of frequencies and uh, the high frequencies will be um, excluded here as well as some low uh, frequencies uh, will also be excluded. Um, and um, in CryoEM, for applying uh, this low pass, band pass, and high pass filters, we will be using so called Gaussian functions. Why Gaussian? And they would look like this because the Fourier transform of the Gaussian function would be a Gaussian function. Why is it important to remember? Um, let's consider, let's consider uh, four images in the real space. Um, and these four images would would, uh, which would look like um, uh, something very broad and uh, uh, in the end we will also look at the delta function. Pretty much it's a, it's a dot. So uh, a very, very narrow, uh, narrow area. So in 2D uh, real space, in, in the real space, they, these images would look like this. But in Fourier space, uh, everything which is broad will be condensed to a very tiny point. To if it's uh, close to infinity, the distribution of this function, uh, that will be delta, delta function in Fourier space. Uh, 
Um, and uh, uh, inversely, um, if uh, there is something very broad in free space, it will be very tiny in, um, in the real space. And we know the relation of the Gaussian uh, functions and uh, Gaussian filters actually uh, allow us to go there and back uh, in, in, in case of the Fourier transforms. Um, and um, Gaussian means that we use uh, a very smooth edges in the, in the masks which we are applying for the images. Uh, again, let's consider this is the Fourier transform uh, of one image, it's an amplitude spectrum of the, of the test image. And uh, um, you can see here, if you're applying a bandpass filter, the areas uh, of, the, uh, of the mask, the edges of the mask will be very soft. And that's how it should be in cryo-EM. Because if edges of the mask are very sharp, and we know that the, the sharp uh, edges, uh, if it's something very uh, small, it's a very rapid transition, it might introduce certain artifacts if we create uh, an inverse Fourier transform. That means that we, would we should never use sharp edge masks. And um, in uh, uh, different software packages, uh, there are uh, parameters which correspond to the soft edges of the mask, and you should always use these uh, masks which would uh, which would have these soft edges. Because if you don't, you might introduce certain artifacts. And this is an inverse Fourier transform of an image which was filtered with a mask in Fourier space with a sharp edge. Okay, so we can go further. Um, in terms of uh, the dimensionality, and we can define also the Fourier transforms of uh, 3D objects. Or if you're a mathematician, you can go up to n dimensions, and you can think in terms of uh, higher dimensions. Um, the most important is just to realize that uh, this generalization is possible, and we will have all the uh, all the properties of Fourier transform which can be applied to the 3D case. And uh, we started uh, with an example of, uh, the, um, of this paper, um, uh, of the reconstruction of the uh, tail of uh, bacteria FHT4. And actually what uh, uh, was done in this work, um, uh, what, uh, they, they took a, um, Fourier transforms of the uh, images, of the recorded images, um, and uh, using uh, the Fourier analysis, they were able to uh, figure out the spatial orientation between these images and taking advantage of the symmetry to reconstruct, um, to perform an inverse Fourier transform uh, of these 2D images into 3D uh, using so-called central slice theorem. Um, it's a bit, uh, it, so it might sound a bit complicated, the central slice theorem, but what it's actually doing, it, it allows to get the 3D orientation of the 2D objects in, uh, um, in Fourier space using an inverse Fourier transform. In this part of the talk, um, I'll try to illustrate, uh, I will try to illustrate a few more cases um, and to demonstrate what uh, else Fourier transforms can be useful for. Let's talk about convolution. Um, to understand uh, the concept of convolution, you need to imagine two functions. First, a function which would look like this, and then a function which would be a set of impulses. For example, um, in this case, it's uh, um, impulses with different uh, amplitudes, and one is negative, and there are four of them. So what convolution would be doing is actually it's blending these two, uh, two functions. And um, convolution would be expressed in uh, using the following uh, mathematical equation. Uh, the symbol for convolution would be this cross, uh, encircled cross. And it might be a bit difficult to think about this in terms of the integrals, in terms of these functions, and so on. Uh, but um, it's more important to understand what the convolution is actually doing. So in one of the lecture notes uh, from one of the Stanford University professors, I found the following uh, phrase that um, when he was asked and uh, the, the topic of the um, of the chapter what 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 is convolution and then he's 
noting that convolution is what convolution does. So don't try to overthink uh, the math, just try to focus on uh, the actual uh, properties um, and the, the actual operation. Let's consider another example. Um, and this, is, this would be the 2D case. Um, and convolve to functions. One function would be um, an image or um, in this case, it's kind of, uh, it's, a, uh, it's like a crystal lattice basically uh, with ones uh, and zeros everywhere. And uh, the second function will be the flower. And when we're blending these two functions, we're getting something like that. Uh, the same principle, um, and this is what would be uh, happening when we're talking about X-ray crystallography. Or the same principle you'll find, you'll find uh, in the uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, what's important to note uh, is, um, again, uh, to compute uh, such an operation, you would be using um, the integral equation. Um, and uh, integration is very um, computationally heavy, uh, heavy task. And it takes quite a while to, uh, to calculate uh, integrals. But uh, calculation of the Fourier transforms, as I said, using the uh, FFT algorithm is very fast. What we can do, we can actually uh, calculate the Fourier transform of, uh, uh, or we can apply the Fourier transform, at least on the paper, to this part of the equation and to this part of the equation. And if we apply a Fourier transform, the Fourier transform um, of, uh, the, of this double integral will be uh, the multiplication of, uh, of these functions, of the Fourier transforms of these functions. So that means that instead of integration, we can calculate a multiplication of the Fourier transforms. That means that we can perform an inverse Fourier transform of these two terms, which are just multiplied. And this is much faster and computationally much cheaper to produce it in Fourier space. So we're talking about multiplication versus integration. So it's very efficient. And uh, uh, later on, uh, you'll figure out that you can perform deconvolution um, uh, for your light microscopy data. So what is deconvolution? Um, you can, again, imagine um, the following situation. So you have a test image and this test image is multiplied uh, with a point spread function. And point spread function is the function which is describing imperfection of your optical system. And then if you zoom in here, you'll see so-called airy pattern. And uh, point uh, spread function uh, in your light microscope uh, might uh, act as a, a Gaussian low pass filter. And in the end, if the original object of your interest um, looks like this, with all the high frequency information, the, um, the data which we are getting in the microscope will be somewhat distorted. So in order to reconstruct the original image, we can apply the convolution and we can take advantage of the Fourier transforms. And this is how this operation is being performed in the light microscopy softwares. Some were uh, software packages. Somewhat similar operation uh, is performed also in cryo-EM, and this is called CTF correction. And again, we are performing uh, two Fourier transforms. Now, um, the second operation, uh, which is very uh, much similar to convolution, would be correlation. And correlation, sometimes they call similarity measurement. And for illustration of the cor correlation, we need to consider, again, two functions. Uh, one function will be um, a, a cropped area of this image. So uh, something which belongs uh, to, to this image. But uh, if we crop an area like this, it will be very hard to figure out where it actually belongs to, because there are many similar areas like that. So um, to calculate uh, the correlation between these two functions, um, or to compare these two functions in order to find uh, where it uh, matches, what we would have to do in real space 
would be um, let's say uh, to, for simplicity it would be like a, an image of just of four pixels and we will have to go one by one pixel um, in in this direction and to compare uh, whether this image belongs to this area or not and if we are lucky enough we will compare different um, different areas and at some point we will figure out that uh, the image and the, the, the first function will be exactly the same as the second function and we can actually measure um, measure the value of this similarity and in order to measure the value of such a similarity again we would have to calculate uh, such a complicated integral and um, as you might already guess if we apply Fourier transform um, uh, to both sides uh, instead of integration we will get multiplication uh, and that means that in order to calculate the similarity measurement we would be able to take an inverse inverse Fourier transform of the uh, multipl multiplied Fourier transforms of each of these functions and using this approach we can actually calculate the correlation map so we can calculate a correlation map between these two images and we will see something like that where uh, the bright areas would correspond to high correlation and dark areas to low correlation and the highest value here will correspond to the uh, to the solution of the problem and where the image actually belongs to the, the cropped area of the image belongs to so in cryo EM we'll apply Fourier transforms um, and uh, the calculations uh, of the, uh, the, the of cross uh, of correlation and uh, these values you you'll find uh, being called uh, cross correlation coefficients uh, you'll find uh, uh, these operations in particle picking and image alignment in projection matching and in Fourier uh, shell correlation. So, speaking about Fourier shell correlation, <coughs> this is the last um, concept I would like to explain to you. Um, to simplify explanation of the Fourier shell correlation, which is correlation in 3D um, of the Fourier components, we will consider Fourier ring correlation. And uh, Fourier ring correlation is a correlation of the uh, uh, of the Fourier components of two images. So what we can do, um, there are two images which are not really related, it's not the same image, it might have a similar object but uh, these two images are different. So what we can create, we can create Fourier transforms of each of these images. And then if we calculate the Fourier transforms we will see different amplitude spectra. So now what we can do, we can create uh, or we can draw certain rings of certain diameters and we can um, we, we can uh, define these rings in a size that they would cover the whole area of our amplitude spectrum so they will be uh, larger and larger uh, with larger and larger diameter and then what we can do we can uh, pairwise create cross correlations between the components for your components within these rings and um, using such a uh, comparison depending which will be dependent on the frequency here is the frequency and here is the correlation value we will uh, we will build a plot build a plot which is called Fourier ring correlation if two images are independent from each other their Fourier components uh, will not be correlated and this curve will oscillate around zero um, and these are the cross correlation values in this plot you also see the curve which is called half bit criterion um, which actually reflects the uh, amount of information in all these uh, Fourier shells but it's a bit advanced topic for now um, Fourier a ring correlation of two similar objects can be illustrated in the following example. For um, so, I took the, this truck image and then I added noise to this image. The noise will suppress high frequency details. You can see some still some low frequency details, some uh, shape of the car. If we calculate the Fourier transform for each of the images, you can see here in the amplitude spectrum that higher uh, frequency components are suppressed. 
if we calculate the Fourier shell correlation between these two images, we will see that there is certain values for the cross correlation of the lower frequency components and it will slowly be going down uh, and uh, to, towards uh, the uh, Nyquist frequency. And uh, here you can see actually also again the half bit uh, criterion curve and the crossing would uh, define uh, the uh, information uh, content of this image. So what's important to understand is this cross correlation curve which would reflect the similarity between these images. Um, <clears throat> if we generalize um, 2D case into 3D, so we can easily imagine that during the refinement procedure of our um, single particle pipeline approach, uh, we can split our data set into halves and we can determine the 3D reconstruction for each of these halves. Then what we can do, we can create a, a Fourier transform, a 3D Fourier transform of each of these half maps. And then the same way we would compare shells, uh, this time shells, not the rings, um, from the origin of the image towards the Nyquist frequency. And then we will see that the lower components of the um, lower Fourier components will correlate higher than the higher frequency components. And this plot is called Fourier shell correlation and uh, uh, where it crosses the criteria uh, for determination of the resolution will determine actually the resolution of, um, of our reconstruction. And uh, it's different uh, compared to X-ray crystallography where you would have resolution as the distance between the origin and the peak of the highest uh, reflection detected. Um, in cryo-EM together with amplitudes we are having also phases and this is the difference. So finally um, <coughs> we'll find the natural Fourier transforms which are happening inside your uh, microscope and the objective lenses will be serving as the Fourier transforms of your object um, and in the uh, back focal plane you will see a diffraction pattern. This would be the amplitudes which will correspond to the projection image of your object. And the second uh, lens can serve as an inverse Fourier transform and then the image uh, you would be having in the microscope would be an image uh, which would be actually affected by imperfections of your uh, optical system. So the objective lens in the electron microscope will work as a Fourier transform. So I've shown you many examples in this lecture, um, but what I would like you to take uh, with you home is understanding that Fourier transform is a mathematical tool which uh, allows you just to decompose a function. It's a, a one-dimensional function or an image or three-dimensional function as a sum of some other periodic functions. And it's just, um, different representation of your data, a different representation, but it's an important representation because it allows you to uh, perform certain convenient computational operations. So therefore, Fourier transforms uh, allow you to facilitate number of your operations with your data analysis, which would be impossible to perform in real space, such as correlation, alignments, filtering, resolution measurements, and some other. It's also important to start using Fourier transform as a diagnostic tool of your data analysis as soon as you can and just to get used to that because each time you're processing your data you can calculate the Fourier transform, look at the amplitude spectrum and check whether you have some issues with your data or not. If you're interested on, in this topic um, I would highly recommend you the lectures uh, from this professor from Stanford University, these are the lectures for um, electrical engineering students and uh, this course is free on YouTube, it's like 30 lectures which are very exciting. Uh, and two books uh, which are classic books on the Fourier analysis uh, from Goodman, Introduction to Fourier Optics and Braceful, the Fourier Transform and its Applications. And with that I would like to thank you for your attention.